Good morning. This is Jim Moore, and you are watching Words of Encouragement, coming to you live. Let me adjust my camera here. Live from Georgetown, Texas. Yeah, so we're here loving Jesus and doing our best to love people, <laughs> including you. So if you're coming on today, say something to us. Let us know that you're here. Today is, um, let me see here. So this is February 9th. It's a Thursday and it's episode number 599. So we're one away from 600 episodes. And uh, this one is entitled The Way to Say I Do. Now, hi, Linda. Nice to have you, Linda McCreary, I think. Um, yeah, the way to say I do. Now, I want to say in the very beginning of this uh, program that this is not just for married people. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Robin. God bless you. This is not only for people who are married or about to get married or even have been married. It doesn't really matter. The principles in the Word of God are vital for our understanding. I think sometimes we we look at different things and we go, oh, that doesn't apply to me. This doesn't apply to me. And there's the other Linda Etherton. God bless. We have a lot of Lindas that come on this program, so glad to have you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, oh, and I need to say right away from the beginning, I will not be on tomorrow. Got some things happening. Tomorrow is Friday. This tends to happen a lot as the week builds. Keep pushing things up, pushing things up. So tomorrow we will not be on. My apologies. But episode number 600 will be Monday morning, and pray for that. It's going to be a doozy. Amen. All right, <clears throat> so often the things that are found in the Scripture that don't seem like they, they apply to us are actually very important. The Bible gives this illustration. Hey, Brandon, God bless you. It gives, it gives the illustration that the parts of the body that are seem to be less desirable or less important actually have been given a greater level of importance. This principle, or let's look at the woman at the, not the woman at the well, the woman that gave the widow, excuse me, that gave the two pennies, or, or the actually it was like a half a penny, two mites. Um, Jesus's, um, the thing that he was trying to get across to people was little can be much. Okay, so things that don't look like they apply really can. So if you are married, if you have not been married, if you ever plan on being married, or if you don't ever plan on being, it doesn't really matter if married, divorced, single, this applies to everyone. And why is that? <clears throat> because it's not just about what happens in the natural, okay? This is really important to remember. The things that are given to us in the natural reflect something of higher value in the spiritual. The visible is a reflection, a lesser reflection of the invisible. Hi, Carmen. God bless you. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like a shadow. We used to call it types and shadows. Think of a, um, the, okay, so the sun's up here in the sky, beaten down, and some person is walking along, and they're casting a shadow. Now, the shadow arrives if they're moving towards you, and the shadow's in front of them. The shadow comes before they do, right? Okay, you thinking about this? The shadow comes before they do. And you don't look at that shadow and go, wow, that is just awesome. That is so important. Well, it is. I mean, it's, it's a reflection of them. This world is in many ways, I'm not trying to be esoteric here in my teaching, but this world is meant to represent the greater. Nobody goes into heaven and go, wow, earth was better. Or, yeah, this is so much less than earth. No, gosh, no. Everybody knows that heaven is the greater reality, okay? God spoke to Moses and he said, listen, when you make the tabernacle, I want you to be precise. Every little loop, I think it was like 50 loops, every color of every curtain, every length, every width, every height, I want you to make it exactly like I'm telling you to make it because, there was a because, not just because I, you better do what I say. No, but because it is a reflection, it is a shadow a foreshadowing, for means before, a foreshadowing of what you're going to arrive at one day in the heavenly realm, in heaven, literal heaven. 
Okay, so marriage, among millions maybe of other things on the earth, represents, <clears throat> well of course it's natural marriage, but it also represents something higher. All right, so it's really difficult to understand the greater reality without first understanding the lesser. Do you understand? Now our brains think this is the greater, what we don't see is the lesser, right? That's how we think of it. Visible is greater, invisible is lesser. It's exactly the opposite. This is the lesser, that is the greater. Okay, so it's really tough to understand the greater, the invisible, until you understand the lesser and the invisible. So, as you're watching today, hi, is that, who is, that's Christine, God bless you Christine. I'm sorry, I can't see very far away. Uh, nice to have you here today. I've been praying for you as a matter of fact. All right, so the lesser, okay, speaks to the greater. So as we're talking today about marriage and the commitment and what it is intended to be both in the natural and the spiritual, do not, pardon the, it's not necessarily a pun, but don't divorce yourself from the higher reality as we talk. Okay, so I uh, just want to be really clear on this before I go into it because it's super important to remember that the lesser speaks of the greater. If you don't have the lesser, for example, you don't have a lamb. I don't know if there's anybody out there that actually owns a lamb, okay? You can't look at the description of the shepherd, right? The great shepherd, Psalm 23, and go, well, I don't have any lambs. I'm not a shepherd. That doesn't apply to me. Of course not. You get what I'm saying? It applies to you no matter what. All right. That's the, uh, that's the foundation. So let's jump into this. Um, what I'm going to show you is a few different scriptures. The first one is found in Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bible, uh, open it up, okay? And I promise you that you're going to see some things that, that are astounding, right? Okay, so many people know the verse that talks about two becoming one and so on. And they are maybe not aware that that is both an Old Testament and a New Testament verse. So again, the, the, the old speaks of the new, right? The new is, it is a better covenant, but it does not eliminate necessarily the revelations of the old. It fulfills. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. Okay? In other words, he was saying, I didn't come to say it was all bad. It's bad law, bad, ooh, ah, e. No, he's, not. he's saying, no, it had its purpose. It's filled its time. Now I am fulfilling it, which means to fill it full. Fulfill, to fulfill something, is switch those words around. Fulfill, full, and fill, switch on, fill, full. So he's saying, I'm, I am filling up that which was, okay, only half full before. All right. So these verses, you're going to be surprised, perhaps, to see how closely they resemble. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, we go all the way back to the original man and the original woman, okay? That's how God made it. That's how God intended to be. To say or do otherwise, I want to be clear about this, is to say you're smarter than God. You are God. I'm the God of my own life. God's not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. That is, in essence at the root of that. You cannot have the mindset of saying, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to obey the way he's revealed it to me. But you know what? There's a lot of pressure socially for me to change. So I think I'll change my mind about that. No, it's never going to work. Okay. And God won't be okay with it. He never will. I'm sorry, but he just won't. All right. Now that's another subject. I'm not going to go into that. <clears throat> Let's read what it says. Adam. Okay. First human being on the planet, made in the image of God. Adam said, uh, excuse me, i got to put my thing down. Now let's give some context. Eve came from Adam, right? God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. This was a like a supernatural, like he's out of it. This is uh, God's anesthesia, as it were. And he with his hand, surgically removed a rib. Now, God could have created Eve a lot of different ways. Again, we take a very shallow, cursory kind of look at these things, and we go, oh, that's, 
that's sexism. Oh, that's bigotry. Oh, that's blah, blah, blah. Instead of really thinking, now why might God have done that? Okay. God takes a rib, could have taken any bone in the body, didn't even have to take a bone, okay? But he's trying from the very beginning to illustrate something, all right? And this illustration runs through the whole scripture. All right, <clears throat> so God himself takes a rib, and the there's a saying out there, and I probably will misquote it, but it's a great you know, ideology about this. He says, God didn't take a bone out of Adam's foot so that Eve could be his slave. He didn't take a bone out of his skull so that he could be intellectually superior over him. And he didn't take a bone out of his either arm or leg or something so that, you know, uh, well, actually, that's not what it says. But he took a bone out of his side next to his heart so that she would always be close to his heart. That is the very intention of God. How to say I do to Jesus, how to say I do to our bridegroom, is the same way we say I do to our, our bride and groom in the natural. We're laying our life down for someone. We're not, you complete me, okay? I know we, we these, these, I'm a romantic, I am, I'm not against the, my wife is probably more so than I am. So I don't think I watch a lot, as many of these sappy love stories as she likes to, but but there's some value in them. They really are. The idea is that he wants us to feel about each other the same way we feel about him. Now, he's superior, right? The, the reason the very first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me, is because he knew our love relationships with people, starting with our spouse, going to our children, so on and so on, friends, loved ones, relatives, whatever, be, could become very, very intense, as it's supposed to be. But it's never supposed to exceed our love for God. Uh, I heard one person say that God is uh, not first on the list. You know, God, spouse, kids, whatever. He said, God is on a whole separate list all by himself. He doesn't even deserve to be on the list, okay? He is the beginning and the ending out of which we make our list. So it's first, it's it's my wife, then it's my kids, then so on. And that doesn't mean we love them less, okay? You get what I'm saying. All right, so God takes a rib to say something. He's saying this whole thing is about the heart. Are you getting that? We think it's about slavery. We think it's about primarily about obedience. Now listen, disobedience will wreck your life. It really will. It will ruin your life. Disobedience is basically, for lack of a better way, maybe saying it's sin. Okay, when you sin, you're being disobedient, you know, and so on and so on. The idea of just disobeying, you know, what God says to do will lead to ruin and destruction, for sure. However, that's not the primary thing. Okay, you can be obedient and not love. Slaves do that. Are you listening? You can be obedient and not love. Be obedient out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of fear, now, I think we should have a sense of duty, and I think we should have the fear of the Lord. We're not disregarding disobe or obedience and disobedience. God, far from it. I think God probably has a higher level or a higher, you know, understanding and, and respect or whatever for obedience than we do, for sure, okay? So we always have room to grow into more obedience. But really, you can obey without loving. But it's pretty tough to love someone without obeying. Now, there, it is possible to love someone and yet not keep them where they need to be, right? God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Do you ever wonder why in the Ten Commandments that commandment's not there? Well, again, because there's, there's the commandment, the first commandment, and there's all the ways we walk it out, okay? That's a standalone commandment. That is the greatest commandment according to the lips of Jesus. You can't get a greater commandment than love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, body, soul, and spirit. There isn't a greater commandment. But then those ten commandments, it says all of those commandments are wrapped up into two of them. Love yourself, 
or love the Lord and then love your neighbors yourself. Okay, and if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're pretty clearly split into those two categories, loving God and loving people. Okay, why did God say on the very first of those Ten Commandments, the very first one is in practical, in the practical walking out of loving God, it is the most important one. Don't have any other gods higher than me. Any other gods before me. Before means in front of me, not in replacement of me, but in front of me. In other words, I believe God knew that we would struggle with, when you think of the word gods, you're thinking of something that is powerful, something that, and not just not just deity, but I mean, things in our life could be gods. Nobody thinks of a, of a, uh, you know, a cigarette or, or alcohol or bad language or theft or any of the, Nobody thinks of those as a God. I worship the cigarette. No, of course not. That's dumb. Okay, but what, what happens is things can become like a God. In other words, anything that rises above the will of Father God in your life becomes a God. So, not to bring you under condemnation, but the point of him saying in the first commandment, uh, have no other gods before me, okay? Not love the Lord your God. That's in a separate, that's kind of like in a separate book all by itself. But have no other gods before me is because the Lord knew. Actually, it's a shield of protection for your heart. Don't allow anything to become superior to your love for me. Okay, don't let anything come before me. Don't let any, and Jesus actually repeated, I know I'm way off track here, but I'll come back to it. Jesus actually added some, like he often did some teeth to that in the New Testament. He said, hey, he said, let me, let me expand on that a little bit here. He says, if you love father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, more than me, neighbor, dog, cat, job, opinion of others, you know, all the, anything. He says, if you love anything more than me, he says, you're not worthy of me. Now, what did he, what's the measure of that? What is the measure of how, if we love? Oh, because nobody's going to go, yeah, you know what? I love my alcohol more than I love God. <laughs> I love pornography more than I love God. I, I love my girlfriend that I'm not married to, but I'm sleeping with. You know what I'm saying? Nobody would ever say they love those things more than they do God. But you know what the test of that is? The test is Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, if you're saying you love me, and you're saying I'm number one, he says, you will obey my commands. So what does that mean? Obedience becomes the litmus test, the acid test. The true test of love is then obedience, okay? So all of this he does to help us understand what it means to have him as number one, okay? I hope that's not too harsh for you, but it just simply is what he stated in the Word, and I'm committed to giving you what he stated in the Word, okay? Whether you like or don't like <laughs> me or the message, all right? Sandy, God bless you. It's been a while. Nice to have you here this morning. All right, let me move on. <clears throat> Adam said, so Eve is actually born, not born, but she is created now. Okay, it's important to remember that Eve and Adam and Eve were both created beings. They were not created after, now we create human beings, right? I saw a meme the other day I thought was pretty funny. Uh, a lady said, uh, I made a human today, what did you do? <laughs> I love that, I think that's great. We need to remember, we're making humans, right? We are doing the work of God by making humans. That's why he put such a high value on human sexuality, because it's not just about you getting pleasure. It's about, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so Eve has been created, and then they too, as they come together, okay, how does that happen? Okay, it's not outside the body. It was not meant to be outside the body. The union of the man and woman coming together was meant to create, okay, union, once you start thinking about your union with Jesus now, union with the bridegroom God, union with God, union with Christ, becoming one with him, which is exactly what the scripture said, is meant to create something. It's not just meant to bless you, although it will, okay? 
It is also meant to challenge you. How many people have been married and say, hey, good morning, Rick. Nice to have you, brother. How many of you have been married and say, you know what? I love what, what uh, one preacher said. He said, God didn't uh, give you a spouse to bless you. He gave you a spouse to kill you. <laughs> and of course, he's saying it tongue in cheek. But what he means is it's a challenge, right? It is a great blessing, but it's also a great challenge. Likewise with Jesus. Okay, we are two becoming one. It's what the Bible says. There's nothing um, inappropriate about that. Nothing pornographic about that. Don't allow yourself to get weird about it as lots of people have. And they've derailed. Yeah, it's There's just people get so crazy. But it is a, about becoming one with Jesus, about becoming one with Christ. Okay, and in that process, you are going to have challenges, just like when you become one with a human being. And two become one. For this cause shall a man leave us, blah, 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 and that two should become one, right? We're going to read it. There's challenges to it. Okay, it's a two, it's a double-edged sword. I'm not going to say it's good and bad, but I'm going to, it's all good, but some of it feels bad, okay? You get mad at each other. You bark at each other. God forbid you take a swing at each other. You say harsh things. Remember this, and I, this is not marriage 101, but it kind of is. Remember your words can damage your spouse as much as a, a physical strike, a punch in the mouth, a smack on the face. Now, I know I'm being a little bit serious here, but this is really important. Oftentimes, we would never raise a hand to our spouse. We would never do something to physically create pain. Hi, Randy. But we will just give ourselves permission to say whatever the heck we want to say. Do you know the Bible teaches that words can actually create more pain and last longer, have a lasting uh, scar that, that is harder to get rid of than a physical... Uh, you smite someone on the shoulder, you give them a bruise, you know, you punch them in the mouth, whatever. You know, that's that's pretty harsh. But we diminish the power of our words. Words can actually kill. They can bring life and death. The power of life and death. That's not a cute metaphor. You can bring life into someone with your words and death. And when you get into a consistent habit of cursing, I know, I know spouses, they constantly curse each other. They have to bomb on each other. I'm telling you, you are, you might as well double up your face. Well, you shouldn't, but you know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's like a, it's like a verbal slap in the face. Okay. You must cease doing that. Okay. That was a, that was an extra for free, but I've seen a lot of this and it's, it's vital that you stop doing that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Speak life. Speak love. Okay. If you are angry and you're about to explode with your, I hate you, and you're so stupid, and all this bad stuff that we say. You know what I'm saying, okay? And then I, early years, have had some times. I don't think I ever told her I hate her, but I think we, you know, and we didn't curse because we've always had a kind of a no to that. But we, you know, we got harsh on each other sometimes, but we don't anymore. We, we understood how stupid that was, how foolish that was, how hurtful that was. And how long it took to get over there. So we learned how to stop doing that. And you can learn too. Just because you've been in the habit of doing it for a very long time, you must repent. I, I'm probably going to lose people right now. <laughs> I didn't plan on going here. But you must break your agreement and stop saying that he, they deserve it. He deserves it. She deserves it. Well, they did it first. But you, you got to stop all of that. you got to quit giving yourself a reasonable, viable reason to keep doing it. Repent before the Lord for doing it and ask him to change you and he'll do it. All right. So let's, let's move on. Adam said, this is now. So this first happens after she came into being. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So Adam understood what had happened to him. He didn't look at Eve and go, oh my gosh, you created a second human. Okay. You need... Eve was unique. Are you listening now? This is huge right here. Woman, women kind. <laughs> I'm going to have all kinds of opportunity to tell jokes here, but I'm not going to do it because the girls will come after me and smite me. Yeah. 
Women are incredibly unique in this aspect. Adam was created from the ground, from the dust of the earth. God leaned over and breathed his breath into Adam and he became a living soul. Okay, that is a very unique, as far as I know, no other human being who ever roamed planet earth had could say I was created in that way. None of them, not one. Okay, singular alone. Now, maybe some theologian will correct me, but just this is my show, so leave me alone. <laughs> okay, number two, second person, second human, Eve. Eve, God did not scoop together some dust, lean over Eve, and blow the, blow the breath of life into her. Okay, this does not diminish her, it actually makes her radically unique. What did he do? He took out of Adam and he did create her, it was supernatural but it was connected to someone else. You see, you're not meant to be disconnected. I think there are times we all look at the guys, maybe I'm the only one, we look at the guys who live out in the woods by themselves, or, you know, this guy's a hermit, or, you know, the, I went out in the, 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 the uh, internet is full of these. I love watching them, actually. Mostly because it's just cool to see how they survive. There's movies or uh, programs like Alone, I, I've watched it. And we all, oh, wouldn't that be great to go out there? No. Yeah, maybe for a little bit, but no. <laughs> okay. From the beginning, God said, the very first thing God said before he created Eve, created Eve, it's not good. The first thing God said was not good, not good, not good, is that a human is alone. Satan will strive to get you alone. He'll strive to make you think you're so different than everybody else, nobody will like you. He'll strive to separate you from people. He'll strive to make you feel awkward and unlovable. And once, are you listening to me? This is really important. Once you believe that, you'll start acting like it. Now, you may have some unique characters, but you know, I have them. I've been told my whole life I have them. Woo, whoopee, okay? So we are, you know, hi, Karen, God bless you. We are unique, okay? But if you believe that you're just weird and strange and ugly and, and, you know, I don't talk good, even Moses, who was actually called to be a speaker for a nation, bought in to the lie that he couldn't talk well. I've actually heard some theologians say Moses couldn't talk well. That's hogwash. The Bible says he was a man mighty in words and deeds. But he believed he wasn't. And once you believe that you're unlovable, you're unlikable, you're strange, you're weird and all that, are you listening to me? You'll start acting that out. You will live out what you believe about yourself. Oh, dear God in heaven, hear what I'm telling you. You will begin to live out what you believe about yourself. Now, you need to believe the truth, right? Okay, if you believe that you're Superman and you can fly... Maybe one day you'll jump off a building. <laughs> you know, it's important that you actually believe the truth, right? Hi, Debbie. Hi. Sorry to missed you. And then there's Dana. God bless you. You get what I'm saying? If you believe the lie, whether the lie says that you're something you're not or that you're not worthy, whatever it is, you'll start acting it out because you believe it. Now, what does this have to do with being alone? The enemy wants you alone. He wants you isolated. And I'm not talking about being set apart for a season of seeking the Lord. Okay, that's different. All right. Okay, he said this woman, now womankind, created different, bone of my bones. And can I say this? You, you carry, are you listening? You carry the DNA of Eve. Ladies, you carry the DNA of Eve. Now, what does that mean? There's a uniqueness about Eve that has been passed down generation to generation all the way to you. And I'm just going to slip something in here real quick. Science, not all of it, because there's some that is very much of God and revealing truths about the Lord. But there's some demonically inspired science, yes there is, that believes they are God. And they literally want to change human beings into a better version of themselves replacing that there is a God and saying, no, we're gods. We're going to alter ourselves. We're going to alter our DNA and so on and so on. That's not this program today, but you realize this. 
God made mankind perfect. He made the humankind the way they were supposed to be. And uh, the arrogance of man thinks they can do a better job than God and they'll never be able to. All right. I've got to move along here. I'll use up all my time. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Remember that. He's talking about physiology. Not the same mind, not the same spirit. This is important, okay? You're not the same brain. Nobody thinks like you do, okay? You're unique in that regard. Your spirit is unique. When you come together, two human beings join themselves together in the, in the context of marriage, because that's exactly what he's talking about. There is a unique happening in the flesh to become one. Why does that happen? Why does it that, that he says she's bone of my bone? Why did God do that? Why did he make her bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? Not just, hey, we're kind of alike, although she's got long hair and curves and shapes and she looks different. Than, no, no. He says, I made you out of each other because you're supposed to becoming one. I split you apart. I'm going to say something here. It's going to shock some of you. And I may lose some of you forever right now, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it, I believe, is the truth. Adam carried within him the feminine characteristics of Eve before she was taken out of him. I believe that with all my heart. Those two distinct were in one, and they're now supposed to come together. Can I say it this way? Husbands? Your wives are meant to soften you up some. And hus or wives, your husbands are meant to, I don't know, make you stronger. We have unique characteristics, I believe, that were all contained in Adam. Now, I don't have a scripture for that, but I believe it's true. Okay? The idea is that God separated them in order that he could make them one again. Why would he do that? Because that is what he's trying to do with us. The Bible says it's a great mystery. Now, don't freak out about this. I'm just trying to illustrate to you. God does everything for a reason. What he did in the natural, he's trying to say something. Hey, this is more about you just being a good Johnny or, or a good Susie. This is about you becoming one with me. Let me read it. This is Adam talking, okay? Uh, he says, she is bone of my bones. That's physical. That's not emotional. It's not spiritual, it's flesh. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I will call her woman because she is taken out of a man. Therefore, because of that, because she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, part of my DNA, part of my structure, okay? Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, not his couple, whatever they happen to be, okay? Satan hates the God-given family, okay? He hates when we stick to the plan of God. Now, society has drifted far away from that, and they're just sure they've got it right. I guarantee you. I promise you on the eternal words of God that one day you will stand before the Lord, whether you believe it now or not, and find out that this is still and forever will be the truth. Hey, there's my love. Speaking of the one I love, all right, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. There comes a time you need to do that. All you guys are living in your mama's basement. Therefore, leave the father and mother and cleave, cleave unto his significant other. His, well, we're not really married. We're just hanging out, living together. We're friends with benefits. No, you're not. You're defying God is what you're doing. You're defying, but thus saith the Lord. I'm sorry. Again, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying this is the truth. You want to know the truth? This, the unvarnished, okay, uncompromised. Well, it's soft pedal it's because everybody's doing something different. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. The Lord were to come today, he would go. Well, yeah. All right. Leave out, cleave to his wife. They too shall become one flesh. Let's expand on that. He didn't say they'll become one spirit. Okay, you are a spiritual being. Your body drops over, you'll still be standing there looking at everybody in the hospital room. You are a spiritual being. 
when you die, your spirit goes back to God who sent it. That's scripture. Your body goes into the ground. One day your body will be resurrected. You are a person with a flesh suit on. Okay. You do not become one spirit. Okay. What about the, the soul? Okay. The Bible says that I would, that your spirit and soul and body, three separate things, just like the Trinity, right? You're made in his image, be sanctified, holy to the Lord. So I am a spirit, I have a soul, I live in a body. You are not becoming one spirit, okay? You are not becoming one soul. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions, best we can tell, okay? You're not becoming, don't expect that your wife, husbands, or your, your, um, your husband's wife are always going to know everything you think, okay? It's great when it happens. It's great when you're on, but it's just don't make the assumption that if you're married long enough, it's always going to be that way because I just don't think it's true. You're not called to be one mind. You're not called to be one spirit, spirit, soul, but you are called to be one flesh. Now, what does that look like? I don't know exactly. Science is still trying to explain that. They say it is scientifically a fact that most people who are married for a long enough period of time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, begin to take on the physical characteristics of their spouse. They start to look like each other. Now, there's all kinds of, I don't, I don't even care. All I know is that that's real. I'm pointing at my scripture. That's true. Okay. Now, Again, you say, I'm not married. I'm never going to get married. I'm divorced. I had a bad marriage. Blah, all of that stuff. I don't, I don't mean to minimize any of that. Okay. That's not, that's all applicable. Okay. But it's not applicable when it comes to you being espoused. As the Bible says, Paul said, I have espoused you to one husband. God in the son, Jesus is literally called a groom. I know a lot of my, a lot of you guys don't like that. You, you need to get over it. I always joke about it. you need to get over it. The girls have been called the sons of God for 4,000, 6,000 years this time. You have to get over it now. We joke around about that, but really you do. Okay. You cannot deny that you are part of the bride of Christ. You just can't and, and get all that you're, I see this all the time because the women, here's the song of song books right there. Shameless plug, okay, if you want to get a Song of Songs book. Oh, by the way, we're starting a our own website, so you'll be able to, yeah, go to my website. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because it's under construction, okay? But I watch who buys these, and it's mostly women. There's a disconnect, guys. There really is. Okay, you should not be ashamed to say, I am the bride of Christ. And so it's not, it's not me individually, it's all of us together. What's the difference? There's still a whole bunch of guys if it's all of us together, okay? This is all nonsensical stuff that we gravitate through because we're afraid to say something feminine. Oh, it's it's perverse. It's this, it's that. No, it's not. No, it's not. Song of Solomon says it's true. John the Baptist, there wasn't a greater living than John the Baptist, and he called Jesus the, the groom. He called him a bridegroom. That's an old-fashioned term for groom. Okay, we just chopped off the bride part and made it groom, bride and groom, okay? But he is a groom, Jesus is a groom, and he calls you men the bride. I'd really like to see a whole lot more men start confessing, you know, buying that book, confessing that they're the bride of Christ, because you are. Even if you don't believe you are, you still are, okay? All right, this is so important about two becoming one. And I believe the reason that God emphasized flesh is because we are the flesh and bones of Jesus on the earth. We are quite literally, as he is in the heavens, the Bible says, so are we on this earth. We are meant to replicate the life of Jesus. And I know we do a poor job of it. I feel like I have, I have barely scratched the surface. That's just me, okay? Don't judge each other by yourself or by yourself by each other. Don't even do that. The Bible says it's not wise to compare ourselves. We all know we have a lot of room to grow, okay? And we're not pretending that we're Superman like we did when we were kids and putting on a cape and running around the yard. And that's not what we're doing. We're not pretending we're Jesus. We're saying this man, this God man who lives and sits on the throne next to God and by the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. We are replicating. We are representing, which literally means re-presenting. 
his life on planet Earth. That's why he chose, instead of saying one spirit, one soul, he said one flesh, because we are his body. The Bible says explicitly, we are his body on the earth. We are his flesh and bones. This idea of union is paramount. Why does, God, why does the enemy hate marriage so much? Because of this. Because of its picture. Because of what it represents. He created it to be a representation of something higher than the natural. Get away, get rid of the representation. You've damaged the picture God created to point people to himself and say, listen, there's more in life than you just getting married and having a job and making little human being babies, okay, and then living and dying and then wondering what's next. That's, you, that's missing. It's missing everything, okay? All right, let me finish reading this. Are you okay? Again, this is why I said so much in the beginning. It's not just about people who are married or think they might be married someday. You might be thinking, oh, this is about how I find a bride or groom. No, it's not, really. The be you know what the best way to find a spouse is? If, if that's even God's will for you, because it's, believe it or not, it's not always his will. You know what the best way to find a spouse is? Focus on the Lord. Let him become your bridegroom. Okay? Focus on that union relationship, becoming one with him. You focus on doing that. And the rest is going to fall in order. All right. Therefore, man will leave his father, mother cleave to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Okay. And they're both naked, the man and his wife, and not ashamed. Uh, there's something there prophetically, too, but I'm, I don't have time. All right. Let's jump to. Did I put that in the wrong place? Oh, I forgot to put it away. Well, it's Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I put it. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse. 32, 32. Uh, Paul, the great apostle, the great former of Christian teaching and doctrine and right understanding of the new and better covenant, this is what he wrote. He borrows from Genesis and he brings it into the new covenant. Okay, right. Because why? Because Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. So Paul is adding to it. And saying, this is a fulfillment. Let's see what he says. For we, he's talking about believers, are members. This is a member. This is a member. This is a member. <laughs> I'm not going to bring my foot up. This, These are members. I, my body, <clears throat> when I say body, I, I'm talking about the whole thing. I, I don't call my hand a body. You get that? Say, people looks at the hand and they say, what is that thing that Jim's holding up? It's his body. No, we don't ever say that. Why? Because we understand that the body is the compilation. The, you know, the everything put together makes up a body. Okay. So, we are members, individual members of his body. Of his spirit. No. Of his soul. No. It is very specific. We are members of his body. And it says, come of his flesh. Of his flesh. We are to be his flesh on the earth. Okay. And you know, there is something that happens physiologically to a believer. I've watched this for 40 years, over 40 years now, on both sides of the equation. You know, sin sucks life out of you as you as you grow into the image of darkness. The life of Jesus and living according to his ways and, and, and having this connectivity with the very life of the universe, it changes the way you look. I've seen 80, 90 you know, year old saints of God who you couldn't tell they were over 60 years old. Because they're connected to the life of God. And then sin, of course, you've all seen pictures. I've seen people that have lived hard lives. Even the world recognizes it. They look at some and say, man, they must have lived a hard life. Why? Because, because of the way they care. Physiologically, something happens to you. All right. Then he begins to quote Genesis chapter 2 and Ephesians 5, 30. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. He is a joint. 
find instead of plead, and they too shall be one. It's not a metaphor. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Okay? They too shall be one flesh. Listen now. He adds this on. This we did not have the privilege of understanding in the first covenant, but we do in the next, the second covenant. Listen to what it says. We, Father and Mother, become one flesh. This is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. Some people think that the bride is some elite group. No, it's the church. It's the ecclesia. Okay. All right. Let me expand for five more minutes. Now, Paul, when he said this, he didn't say, well, you know, it's kind of a mystery that now we have full understanding of it. No. When the great revelator of New Testament understanding, who had Revelation 14 years in the desert, says the words, a great, not just a mystery, but a great mystery, you can write it down that we probably have not plumbed the depths of this mystery. I say, oh yeah, I know that. I, I yeah, I, I understand. And I go, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You probably, probably don't. Why am I saying that? To make us feel bad? No, just that that when when there's a mystery that the Bible says is a great mystery, it typically means it's in the process of becoming unveiled as we go. All right. How, what do you say? What do you do? Say I do. You know, when a man or woman gives themselves to their spouse, they utter the words, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor. These are not biblical. Nobody pulled that, those vows, we call them vows, which are, a vow is a promise, right? Okay. Nobody pulled that out of the Bible. Somebody saw, I believe, that, that these were essentials. And I do believe that they mirror the essentials of becoming a part of that company called the Bride of Christ. Okay, you are agreeing to becoming married, union with him. You're agreeing to that. It doesn't happen the day you come to the altar. I know people believe that's true, but it's not. You say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm married to Christ because I because I said, and it, yeah, well, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I married Christ because I said I do on, on uh, the day I came out of the altar and I wept through to a, a Christ-filled salvation. No, no, you're not one with him because you said a prayer. You're not one with him. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. You have not become one in all aspects with Jesus, with the Christ, the Messiah, because you prayed the four spiritual laws or you confessed your sins and asked him, yes, he forgave your sins. Yes, he moved inside your body. His spirit's in you. He says, if you I knock at the door, if you open, I'm going to come into you. He will come into you. He says, and then I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. That's massive. But it doesn't mean you have completed the process of union. To marriage, the word marriage means to marry two things into one. The marriage of this and that becoming one. You get what I'm saying? That's a really good news because what that means is you still have time. Okay, God is still working on you. That's the old song we sing. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the moon and Jupiter and Mars. How lovely and patient he must be. He's still working on me. What is he doing? He's making you one with himself. Do you know what really helps? Is after you say, I do. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and health. You see, it really helps after you said that, if you understand that it's a process. Because if you believe it's instant, then you will constantly be disappointed in yourself and in the Lord too. Okay, for better, for worse, for rich, for poor. We do a great disservice to, to people when we leave that out. Imagine two people becoming married and they don't have any promises. Nobody does that. At least they shouldn't. 
Okay? I am making a promise that when th if things are better or when they get better or if they get worse. When we're richer, we have abundance or if we're in poverty. When we're healthy or if, I like saying that when or if because it's not always going to be either one. But we're saying if bad times come, if sickness comes, if poverty comes, it doesn't matter. I'm sticking with you. And do does the bridegroom of the universe deserve less? You see, sometimes the reason we have a hard time keeping the I do's that we give to one another is because we haven't made the I do's to our heavenly bridegroom. Amen. All right. I'm going to, uh, I actually had two more verses there and I'm out of time. What it says for husbands to do, it says, love your wife like Christ loves the church. I, I mean, I am still trying to do that. Okay. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay. It's not a, a box you check off. Love your wife as, God, as Christ loves the church. Okay. In Jesus name. Amen. I'm done. Check that box off. Let's move to the next. No, that's not how it is. It's supposed to be a lifetime process. It's supposed to be. Okay. And again, if you're, if you've lost, if you're a widow or a widower or you're a divorcee or doesn't, or single, it doesn't matter. You focus on Jesus and he'll take care of the rest. All right. And then the next thing, it talks about husbands loving your wife or wives loving your husbands. And really it talks about uh, doing so uh, through respect and reverence. Whole big teachings on that. They're all awesome. And uh, I think Danny Silk wrote a really good book about marriage called Keeping Your Love On, where he goes into that. And I think there's actually a book called Love and Respect, I think. Anyway. Lots of good stuff out there. So thanks, guys, for listening. I hope you saw this in both the natural and the spiritual, both the invisible, the visible and the invisible, both the earthly and the heavenly, because that was my goal today. If you know anyone that might benefit from this, I would ask you humbly to take a minute. As soon as you say goodbye and this program ends, just it'll it'll be there on your page. It should be anyway, or at least it'll be on my page. There ought to be a share button. Hit the share button, copy the link, and then just text it to someone. You can paste that link into the uh, into a text. You don't have to share it on Facebook, but it uh, it helps that they're on Facebook. But anyway, God bless you again. I will not be on tomorrow. Um, Thank you for your support. Thank you for those of you who sent some support to Linda and I through the links that we provide. You don't know how much we appreciate it. It seems like we're always in a place of need. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, and those of you who send what you might consider a small amount, please don't think of it as small. I really believe what Jesus said about the widow's might, that she cast in more than everyone put together. And I really believe that. So don't not... Uh, help by because you think your help won't matter or somehow you're embarrassed. Don't you be embarrassed by that. No, that that's the enemy. <laughs> anyway, God bless you. And the last thing I'm going to tell you, last but not least, we are in the process of creating, constructing a website so that we can say what we want to say, whether YouTube or Facebook or anybody else doesn't like it. We will be putting all of our stuff on there Yes, we'll still be on some other outlets. I'll have to tell you more about that later. But you'll be able to order uh, merch. <laughs> I have a hard time keeping up. Merch, you know, uh, merchandise, uh, you, be, you know, stuff that we have, you know, T-shirts we have, say Jesus, stuff like that. You'll be ordered to get this stuff on. You should be able to get our books. You'll be able to get everything right there. Our website, um, links that we think are important. Uh, lots of stuff, hopefully. So pray for me. I am not the Mr. Techie guy. I really had an argument with the Lord about this. <laughs> Why do you make me do this? But he knows what he's doing. So anyway, love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, be encouraged today. Know that God loves you. Know he's fighting. He's your biggest advocate. He is your greatest supporter. He is in your corner. He loves you. Even when you blow it, he still loves you. He doesn't excuse it, but he says, come on, let's get up. Let's move forward again. That's all he wants is for you to keep pressing on to him. So God bless you. We love you, all of our family and friends. And Lord willing, the creek don't rise. We will see you Monday morning. God bless you and give yourself permission. <laughs>